Hello, everyone. This is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now, this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Rescue 3, respond out to the CNM main campus at 525 Buena Vista Drive Southeast, Crush It of Coal and Oxford. It's going to be in the West Building, Room 12, 3 Firebox 8032. Male burned his hand with their steam burns during his welding class. 7 Alpha 3, Rescue 3, CNM Main Campus, 525 Buena Vista Drive Southeast, West Building, Room 12, 7 Alpha 3. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the AFR Podcast. We're going to start off today's episode with a quiz. So, Dr. Pruitt, what is the strongest muscle in the body? Ooh. <laughs> I, uh, off the top of my head, I would say it's probably the jaw. Oh, yeah. That's what I said, too. So... I had a story about uh, when I was a kid, our teacher asked us that, but the lesson plan happened to be talking about like the heart. And so the answer, of course, was the heart. But my mom told me it was a jaw. So I was like, but but, but mama said, but but, but mama said. (laughs) And uh, I I remember I didn't like that teacher for the whole rest of the year. I would would have to agree with your (laughs) mama. I bet mama was right with that one. There we go. All right, so the real question is, what is the largest organ in the body? That would be the skin. All right, so we're talking about uh, burns today, and we're going to be covering the skin. Now, some of the functions that the skin provides that uh, we might not remember, it's going to be an environmental barrier, pathogen protection, prevent all those germs from getting in our body. It's going to allow you to uh, feel sensation, going to help with thermoregulation, whether it's sweating or uh, goosebumps, and also uh, metabolism. Now, how, how does it work with the metabolism? Um, it actually is a critical piece of metabolism for production of vitamin D. So the sunlight hits your skin and it sends off a cellular cascade and it helps your kidneys um, produce vitamin D, which will make strong bones Okay. and other things. So when we're talking about burns, we're going to just be damaging that skin, which has all those functions. And there's going to be three different kinds of burns. So we have thermal, electrical, and chemical. We're going to start off with thermal. I would suspect that's probably the most common. Thermal tends to be the most common. That's correct. Okay. And then we'll get into electrical and chemical at the end. And uh, before we get into it, actually, um, how often do you see burns? Because... I haven't run across them too much besides like burning myself on a pizza oven one time. Ouch. <laughs> that sounds painful. Um, they're not that frequent. I say I see maybe one or two a month. They tend to be a little more common in pediatric patients that maybe pull hot water or something off the stove onto their skin. Um, honestly, when I was in Tennessee doing my residency, I saw um, people who had uh, home laid uh, meth labs oh. or f- homemade fireworks, actually. Um, I saw a lot more burns when I was there than I have <laughs> since I've been back in New Mexico. Okay. And you're going to see all the bad ones being at UNM, right? Yes. We are the only burn center in the state. So typically any bad burn that happens anywhere in proximity will come to, to the university for care. Okay. So... We'll move into thermal burns. Now, thermal burns, the depth and severity of the burns, it's going to depend on um, the length of contact with that heat source and how hot it was. Yeah, so um, the severity of the burn is going to um, be determined by how long the length of contact with the, the hot surface. And what do we do? What's like our very first thing we got to do for treatment of these burns? So initially you want to remove them from the stimulus, right? So if you have someone who is actively being burned, you want to say like it's a fire, obviously you want to remove them from the fire. But if there's clothing or materials or something on top of that skin that's continuing to be scalding, you want to remove that material if you can. Obviously safely, don't burn yourself in the process. But um, an issue would be like maybe maybe tar or something sticky that's actually stuck to that surface. If you can't peel it off, you want to cool it. So maybe quick immersion in water or some sort of uh, cooling pack or whatever you have at your disposal to stop the, stop the amount of contact and intensity of the time of that burn. Okay. 
All right, and then we can break it down, uh, the treatment. So if we have a small amount of body surface area burnt, like less than 10%, our guidelines tell us that we can use uh, cool, moist dressing for that. Yeah, and that's not really, that mostly is just going to help with pain control. Um, one, we talked about cooling off the skin, so it can still be burning even if it is removed from the stimulus. So cooling that area um, will help with pain and also maybe help decrease the extent of that burn. Now you have to be careful there because we talked about the important functions of skin. Part of it's going to be protection from the environment. And so if it's too cool and say it's cold outside that depending on the amount of body surface area involved, that patient could get hypothermic. So I'd be judicious about how aggressively you cool them. Really the point of the cool, dry, cool, moist dressing would be pain control. Okay. <coughs> and then everything over 10% uh, it says dry bulky dressing. So, man, I think I, I learned some, some things wrong actually when I was going through paramedic school, I was always, I think I remember seeing a picture of like somebody's finger getting burnt and they just like wrap them all up in curlex, like each individual f finger. Um, but now that I think about it, I'm like, it seems like when you go to unwrap that, that'll just cause a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, curlex can, especially like if it's a, superficial or superficial partial thickness burn that the skin as a reaction to the insult is going to secrete serous fluid and it's kind of that sticky stuff you get before you get a scab and if you're putting curlex on there that curlex is going to stick and the first thing the hospital is going to do is take that off and so it's it's going to hurt as it gets pulled off so really um with burns uh, less is more if you're going to do a moist dressing that's fine for pain control but um beyond that usually just a dry sheet Okay, so we got the burn sheets in our uh, orange bags. So those have those are a little bit different, I guess. They're not going to stick as much. Yeah, it's kind of like a big inside of the band aid, <laughs> oh, okay. kind of thing um, that doesn't stick to the to the serous fluid that comes out. And what that'll provide for you is it'll protect against so all the functions that the skin does that that skin that's now gone can't do um, would be protection from the environment, keep keep germs out, keep heat in. Um, all those things, just a dry sheet can go a really long way. All right. So really that's just going to be our actual dressing on the burn. It'll just be that, that burn sheet. So if it's on their back, like line the gurney with the burn sheet, or if you, you know, there's, if the engine's there, you'll have two. So, uh, you can have one lining the gurney for the back and then you can have one covering up for the anterior part yeah and that'll be more comfortable for the patient pain control is huge here so if you need to you can do intranasal or intramuscular um fentanyl a lot of people ask about um ointments that you might want to put on the burn and again that's not recommended either because especially like the silver sulfadiazine or something that might um be really thick um the hospital is just going to have to take off when you get there so they can do their tests and their evaluation of the extent of the burns okay so yeah, in my mind, I was just always planning on wrapping everything up with Curlex. So now that I can't do that anymore, what if I just showed up and they had some burns to their fingers and I just showed up with nothing on it? What? That would be absolutely okay. Okay. Um, yeah, if you have some pain control on board, if, if their fingers are burning, depending on the degree of burn, if you need to cool them off, you can do the moist dressing or maybe a moist towel over the top for some pain control, but... Otherwise, um, I don't know that it needs that much intervention. Okay. All right. So there is some criteria that we have to remember out there. UNM, like you mentioned, is going to be our only burn center in the state. Um, so anybody, let's see, partial thickness burns over 25% for adults is going to go to UNM or over 20% for kids. And then anything over 10% full thickness burns. And then there's some also some uh, specific parts of the body. So the hands, face, eyes, ears, feet, genitals, or circumferential burns, those all go to UNM. Mm -hmm. Basically, to keep it simple, any significant burn is going to need a burn center. Um, so. All right. Now, how do we calculate that um, body surface area? I mentioned all those numbers before, but uh, this is the best way to remember okay. it. Okay, So I'm sure everybody's been taught the rule of nines. So if you can break the parts of the body into factors of nine, so in an adult, say an arm would be 9%. 
a leg would be um, 18, head would be 9, and uh, kids are a little bit different where the head is a little bit bigger, so the head in a child would actually be 18, and the extremities are smaller, so they'd be 13 and a half each. Okay, yeah, so to make up for the bigger head, they cut the the legs down to 13 and a half only? Yeah, yeah. So that's a lot of math for me. I don't know about you, but I am terrible with numbers. And then you put nine as a factor in there, and it just hurts my head. (laughs) So one thing uh, I learned in residency that I tend to use more often than the rule of nines is um, just the Palmer method to estimate body surface area. And what is that? Um, So if you take the patient's palm, so it can be a child or an adult. I was just thinking about this and using my own hand and i'm glad you brought that up yeah so it it has to be the patient's hand and that's going to be proportional to the body surface area and it includes the fingers so if you take the palm including the fingers that's one percent of your body surface area and you can put their palm over the area of the body that's burned and get a very quick fairly accurate estimation of the area that way and then you don't have to do any multiplication involving nines All right. And that's to get body surface area. Again, I mentioned the criteria earlier. And then there's also, uh, so that's how much of the body is burned. And now we have the depth of the burn. So can you go over the different depths? Yeah. So superficial is pretty easy. That's going to be your basic sunburn. The skin's going to be a little red, a little tender to the touch and warm, but that epidermis is not violated. Um, What used to be referred to as a second degree burn, there's now two two basic categories for that. That's going to be your partial thickness burn. So you can either have superficial partial thickness or deep partial thickness burns. The way to tell the difference between those, so think about your sunburn that turns into a blister. And then when that blister peels off, it's very moist underneath and still very red and tender. That's going to be your superficial partial thickness. Okay. The deep partial thickness is going to be that first layer of skin that's removed, just like that blister, but it's going to be dry underneath. It's still red, still tender, but it's not going to be weepy like the superficial okay. partial thickness So I think my, uh, my pizza oven burn, I think that was a superficial partial thickness because it had a big old blister, and then uh, once that blister popped, it was real moist underneath. Okay. Yeah. Those are, these can be very painful. <laughs> is there a, is there a fourth degree born? I thought I re- remembered learning about that at one point. I think the fourth degree went away when they divided the superficial partial thickness into two. Um, the new third degree is, um, what they call full thickness burn now. Okay. All right. So we talked about some of the treatment that I was planning on doing everything wrong, wrapping in curlex. Don't do that anymore. Uh, burn sheet. Uh, we talked about pain management. You already mentioned that. Now, I also remember having to memorize that Parkland formula. Yeah, another bit of math that just makes my head hurt. Um, Luckily, more and more research uh, with burn victims has come out that's pointing to a lot of fluid can actually do more damage. And so what we're starting to titrate in the hospital to is monitoring really closely urine output and not so much flooding these patients with fluid up front, but giving them enough fluid to keep keep their urine output up but not so much that it's changing their electrolytes so if we have somebody with a pretty decent burn you know what what should we get started with okay so you'll see this emerging literature reflected in our guidelines Um, if it's greater than 20 percent body surface area and now that we can measure that using the palmer method that's a little easier um, we're just recommending a pre-hospital bolus of 500 to okay. start with. And when you're talking about IVs and burn patients, I remember learning that you don't want to start it on an affected extremity if you can avoid it. Is that something else I got wrong? Yeah, no, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, the recommendation would be to not go through the burned area if possible. Now, if your patient has such extensive burns that you really do need to get this bolus going um, and give them some IV pain medications, and it's it's okay to go through that burned area if you have to, but it's not recommended. Okay. All right. So somebody that's been significantly burned you know most likely they've been exposed to a lot of heat they could have been in a structure fire say Um, so there's a chance that there's going to be some airway involvement too what's that going to look like and then you know 
what do we have to worry about with that airway? So anytime you have a burn patient, especially a thermal burn patient, um, airway is going to be your number one priority. Um, things that you could look for for impending airway emergency would be soot in the mouth. So if they're coughing and their sputum coming up with black specks in it, or you look in their mouth and you see their tongue or their teeth are black. Um, singed facial hair is another clue to possible airway compromise or impending airway compromise. Okay. So if you see singed facial hair, but you don't hear strider, should we just think it's on the way? Yeah, I would anticipate. So burns evolve over time and especially inhalational burns. So whatever came through the mouth is going to cause some inflammation and then that's going to also going to cause inflammation in the lungs. Um, just because you don't hear strider right now doesn't mean that it's not coming. So I would anticipate with every burn victim, anticipate that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. If we have a, say a person, he's got a singe facial hair, he's got soot all around the mouth, but he's still conscious. What's the treatment going to be for that person? So that's a patient where you're worried that his airway is going to get bad, even if it's not bad right now. So that's a still a critical patient you want to load and go quickly with. I would still do high flow O2 and okay. support that airway as and much And actually as you, you start to hear uh, strider on that patient, but he, he is still conscious. So when you hear the strider, what are you going to do? You them? could try it. So this is a patient that's going to need to be intubated. You can try it out. He's, he's probably still going to have a gag, so you're not going to be able to. There's really not much we can do since we don't do RSI or rapid sequence intubation with a paralytic in the field um, other than supporting that airway on the way to the hospital right now. All right. Get him to the hospital yeah. as fast as you yeah. can. Now, what if he goes unconscious on um, the way? So if he goes unconscious, that's when I would move to try to intubate. You're probably going to get one look, and I would anticipate that this is going to be a difficult airway. So have all your stuff ready to go. I'd use a smaller tube than normal. So an um, average, say, adult male would take maybe a 7.5 ET tube. I'd probably start with a 6.5 for my first look. And then um, if that fails, I would have a low threshold to do a crike. This is the patient that would likely need one because the upper airway is becoming obstructed. Okay. And trying to innovate this person is... Uh are you a fan of the bougie? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And now if this person, again, they've, they've got these signs, they've got the strider present, then they went unconscious. Um, should also be, we talked about cyanide poisoning in a previous episode, but it seems like this person, once they have that altered LLC, that you'd be suspicious of that again. Absolutely. That's a fantastic point. I'm glad you brought that up. If this is a patient that you've pulled from a structure fire and they obviously have airway involvement, I would have someone else helping to get that cyano kit ready, especially if they're unresponsive with soot in the mouth um, in the right setting. That's a patient that absolutely needs a cyano kit. Okay, and, and real quick, or not the whole episode again, but what's going to happen with that cyanide poisoning? So the altered mental status? Altered mental status, um, it's basically the byproducts of the synthetic materials that are burning, so it's going to shut down cellular metabolism and basically suffocate cells from being able to use oxygen. So you're looking for altered mental status, abnormal vital signs like tachycardia, um, soot around the mouth would suggest that they were exposed to it and um, really low threshold. You're kind of looking for the patient that was pulled from an enclosed structure right. fire. <laughs> and these patients can end up hypotensive eventually? Eventually hypotensive, yeah. They start where everything is kind of sped up, so they're breathing fast, their heart's beating fast. They're trying to compensate for the cellular hypoxia, and then as cells start to die, everything starts to slow down, so they might get bradycardic, might get unresponsive, hypoxic, um, shallow breathing. So really the whole spectrum. Okay. And then we got the hazmat squads. We got the hydroxocobalamin or the cyano kit is going to be the antidote for this. Yes. And I know the seven, eight carries at least two of them. And it's important to remember they're going to need to be reconstituted too. So it takes a minute to set them up. Okay. So yeah, they, they're going to come five grams. Um, you got to put in like 200 cc's. There's a line, a fill line on there. And one of the things it says on the box is you want to make sure that you're not shaking it up. You just kind of like rock it back and forth. And then once you have it reconstituted, you uh, drip that in over 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it'll be red. So it's important to tell whoever's around that it's going to change everything's color. So tears might become red. Any body fluids will be pink tinged and the fluid itself will be red as well. All right. Another point to bring up is, you know, with cyanide poisoning, there's also a chance of, uh, 
carbon monoxide poisoning, we do have those. Again, if you have a life pack with one of the white cords, um, pulse ox that goes on there, it'll automatically change. If the once the carbon monoxide is over that 10 threshold, it'll change it automatically for you. Or there is a way to put push the button on the life pack to see what the uh, carbon monoxide reading is. That's an excellent point. That's another poisonous gas that's easy to forget about because it's not it's odorless, colorless, tasteless, and the oxygen saturation could easily be 100, but they could still be very poisoned. So the treatment for that's just going to be high flow oxygen. Okay. All right. Well, that's going to cover uh, thermal burns. So we'll move into electrical burns. What are the key takeaways on electrical burns? Um, key takeaways for electrical burns is they can look um, fairly innocuous. You might see just one little entry point, say, on a finger where the person got shocked, but it's really important to realize that there could be significant underlying tissue damage um, that you just can't see. So take every electrical burn very seriously. And are you searching out like a exit wound, kind of like a gunshot wound? or? Yeah, um, these patients probably need to be exposed, and they'll probably be able to tell you where, but you look for an entrance and an exit if you can find it. All right. And then uh, with all that electricity they're exposed to, um, should we be suspecting some arrhythmias? Yeah, you can. So one reason why it's important to look where the entrance and exit is is because you can tell what tissues were affected in that arc. So say my right finger has maybe an entrance wound and my left finger has the exit wound. What that tells you is that arc of current just went straight across all the structures in my chest, including my heart. So you can kind of map what organs you think would be affected or even what size muscle groups might be affected because you just imagine that all that tissue is being damaged as that current is going through. So and what's in, uh, important. So we're on scene. We might have access to some more information that the ERs can have access to. What's some uh, information that you would want if there's another electrician there? So important questions to ask would be what type of current is it? So is it AC or is it DC? AC is going to be a little bit worse um, or more severe. You definitely, if you can, um, ask somebody about the voltage. Um, will also just help when you get to the hospital determine the severity. Okay. And treatment for these electrical burns, I would imagine pain's going to be... Um, pain control will be big. Um, I would go ahead and start to bolus this person. Um, it can basically, depending on the muscle groups that it goes through, can basically put you into instant rhabdo okay. with muscle destruction. So fluids is a good idea. Also, if it goes through any cardiac um, muscles, you can try to anticipate arrhythmias and a 12 lead would impor be important and it wouldn't be a wrong idea to get the pads on there and um, be ready to defibrillate if you need to. All right. Now we'll move on to chemical burns. So let's th think of a unknown chemical powder that's burning through somebody's uh, forearm, say. Okay. Um, so if it's a powder, um, initial actions would be pretty simple. Just try to brush it off. Um, and obviously not with a bare hand because it, then it would burn you. You want to be as safe as you can and use either a paper or whatever you have at your disposal to get that off of there to stop the stop the burning. Meanwhile, it would be important to try to identify that material. Um, all right. And then once it's all you brushed off what you can brush off, but it's still kind of some of it still got and uh, is burning that skin. How do you do the um, treatment on that? The next step would just be copious irrigation. And usually water is fine for the majority of these types of burns. So if there's a sink nearby, don't wait to get them in the ambulance to get that stuff off of there. Okay. Um, if there's a sink or some form of water, try to do that immediately. Yeah, or at the workplace, a lot of the you know workstations all have those um, eye stations, irrigation stations, mm -hmm. things like that. Exactly. Uh, what about if it's in somebody's eyes? How do you treat that? Same thing. So the eye wash station, if you can, copious irrigation is going to be the answer for that. Um, if you don't have water immediately available on scene, you can use uh, normal saline bags. They'll be fine. Um, with just IV tubing, and you might be able to put an IV catheter on the end and irrigate the eyes that way. Okay. Just irrigate it out all the way into the hospital. Once you get to the hospital, you guys got these like little contact things you can put in. Mm -hmm. They're called the Morgan lens and they're exactly like contacts, but they uh, attach to normal saline and you can irrigate the eye that way. All right. And then let's see if you have time, I guess you mentioned calling poison control. It could be some kind of a 
there's, there's so many different chemicals out there that you never know exactly what the best treatment is. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. So um, while you're on scene, if you have if you have an extra set of hands there, trying to identify that chemical is going to help the hospital as they're treating this patient. And then once the chemical is identified, you can call poison control and ask because there's a small percentage of chemicals where water is actually going to make it worse and not better. All right. So poison control number 800-222-1222. I call them a lot, so that's a good number to dial, uh, put on speed dial on your phone if you need it. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Pruitt. I, I uh, learned uh, quite a few things actually today, so hopefully everybody else did too that's out there listening. And uh, thanks thanks again. Listening to these podcasts is just a good way to take your job you know, seriously and think about these calls before we actually go on them. So thanks for listening and talk to you on the next episode. Okay. Thank you.